small fry are experimenting with jet propulsion. And that's all right, because in the world you'll be in charge of tomorrow, jet propulsion will be a standard method of getting around. You'll understand why those jets zip through the air when you understand that the principle behind the balloon and the jet is the same. When a balloon is blown up, it is full of potential energy in the form of air pressure. However, nothing will happen as long as the opening is held shut. But when you let it go, the air rushes from the opening at high speed. The balloon travels in a direction opposite to the flow of air escaping from the balloon. This action can be explained by Sir Isaac Newton's third law of motion, which states that for every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. In this example of Sir Isaac Newton's law, the action, that is, the force of the air escaping from the balloon, causes an equal and opposite reaction, or force, which pushes the balloon through the air. This is the principle of jet propulsion reduced to its simplest terms and it's been working a long time. 2,000 years ago, Hero of Alexandria, a famous Greek mathematician, experimented with jet propulsion. Hero developed the first jet engine, in fact, the first heat engine of any kind. Instead of using air pressure, his engine used steam. Steam spurted into the air through nozzles, and the reactive force in the opposite direction turned the engine. It's a long, long step from Hero of Alexandria's primitive engine to the turbojet engines of today. But that's the step we had to take when late in World War II, our Army command heard disturbing news. The Germans had jets. And as crude as they were by today's standards, their speeds far exceeded the best we could throw against them. Here was a challenge to American ingenuity. Using preliminary designs already in existence in both England and this country, our engineers went to work to answer the challenge, to build a vast quantity of jet engines in record time. This is where the Allison organization came into the picture. With the experience of five wartime years in the production of high-speed aircraft engines, they had the know-how and the production facilities to do the jet job. In fact, since the early days of the Indianapolis Speedway in 1913, Allison had been working on speed and more speed. They had helped build the famous Liberty 12 in World War I, the first high-powered aircraft engine in our nation's history. Twenty years later, at the approach of World War II, they came up with the liquid-cooled V-1710, the first 1,000-horsepower engine which successfully met all military specifications. More than 70,000 of these compact engines, with their 12 cylinders arranged in two banks of six, were delivered to the world's fighting air forces. This engine powered six of the U.S. Air Force's hardest-hitting fighter planes. The Curtis P-40 Warhawk, the workhorse of the AAF in the early days of the war. The revolutionary Lockheed P-38 Lightning. The North American P-51A Mustang the Bell P-39 Air Cobra and P-63 King Cobra. Later came the North American F-82 Twin Mustang, the last U.S. Air Force fighter to be powered by reciprocating engines. Meanwhile, the 24-cylinder V-3420 had been developed, an engine which produced what was then the terrific output of 3,000 horsepower. But now the day of the reciprocating engine was fading it had become apparent that in the search for higher horsepower to produce greater airplane speed, a new type engine would be required. Already, piston type engines had approached a practical limit in size, weight, and complication. In order to achieve higher horsepowers, weight would have to be increased still further, and accessories would become even more complicated. The gas turbine engine seemed to be the answer for preliminary development had shown that jet engines could produce much more power per pound of weight than any other engine known. So, in this country, the emphasis turned to jets. The need for jets was urgent. As we know, the jet engine operated on an entirely different principle. Here's how the modern jet engine works. 
air is drawn into the engine here, compressed, and forced into the combustion chamber. Fuel, gasoline or kerosene, is injected at this point, and the mixture of compressed air and fuel is ignited by spark plugs. After starting, the burning is continuous, and the spark plugs are no longer used. The hot gases expand rapidly and are directed against the blades of the turbine wheel, causing it to spin. More than half of the power of the gases escaping from the combustion chamber is used to drive the compressor to pump vast quantities of air in a steady flow. The rest of the power in the heated gases rushes into the atmosphere through the tail cone. The equal and opposite reaction to this rearward blast is the thrust which drives the airplane forward. Theory is one thing, but putting theory to work is something else again. It takes plenty of knowledge, backed up by plenty of facilities and money, to put jet engines into the sky. Here at Allison, all the experience and facilities in the field of engines for high-speed aircraft were concentrated on the task of developing a jet engine in record time. There were more than 4,000 design modifications before the engine came up to required standards for performance. And new tooling was required. New processes were necessary, new test facilities needed. No engine ever received so much test attention as the jet, for technicians were far out in no man's land of scientific exploration. The turbine blade caused more sweat and tears than any other part in the development of the jet engine. A single blade, which you can hold in your fingers, produces more power than the engine in your automobile. It rotates at about 12,000 revolutions per minute and is heated almost to the melting point by blazing gases. These were problems entirely new in the handling of metals. Parts were assembled, then burned to death. Overspeed tests were run at more than 19,000 revolutions per minute. And metals ripped and tore like paper. But the design engineers and the metallurgists and the process engineers came up with the answers. This successful jet engine produced more power at less weight than the world had ever known. The first Allison jet engine came off the production line on schedule and they kept coming. By VJ Day in August 1945, around 160 of these jet engines were coming off the assembly line every month. Continuing experiments increased the original power output per pound of engine weight by 64%. At the same time, they gained 15% fuel saving for greater range for the airplane. This jet puts out three times as much horsepower at less than half the weight of the 3,000 horsepower reciprocating engine. 9,000 horsepower measured in smooth, concentrated thrust at 600 miles per hour. But all the requirements for high-speed aircraft power were not satisfied. The search for more power, more speed, is never ending. Constant improvement brought a second jet engine, smaller in diameter, which uses a slightly different method of air compression. This new engine developed rapidly, for experience accumulated on one engine is quickly applied to another. This model, now in production, develops 5,000 pounds thrust, a thousand pounds more than the first model, for still more power, engineers have developed the afterburner, a long hollow tube which attaches to the tail cone at the rear of the jet engine. Since only one-fifth of the air brought into the jet engine is used for combustion, the other four-fifths used for cooling the engine reaches the tailpipe with its oxygen unburned. In the afterburner, the unused oxygen from this air is mixed with a new supply of fuel and is ignited. This afterburning increases the original thrust of the engine by about one-third. Afterburning gives an extra surge of power in takeoffs or in combat. But all these new developments in jet power have not yet made all propeller-type airplanes obsolete. Long-range heavy bombers still require the fuel economy of propeller-type engines. This new Allison T-40 Model 500 turboprop engine, which has been developed for the U.S. Navy, is the most powerful propeller type engine in the world. It develops 5,500 horsepower for only 2,500 pounds of weight, over two horsepower for each pound, 
and approaches today's reciprocating piston engines in fuel economy. Here's how it works. Air is drawn into the compressor here, forced into the burners, and mixed with fuel, exactly as in the turbojet engine. The burning gases again operate the turbine. However, the turboprop engine is designed so the turbine will draw off much more of the energy of the escaping gases. This turbine not only drives the compressor, but also, through a reduction gearbox, drives a propeller. The energy which is left, less than 10%, escapes from the exhaust in the form of a small amount of jet thrust. First installation of the T-40 turboprop engine is in this U.S. Navy XP-5Y flying boat, which, with four of these powerful engines, will fly in excess of 400 miles an hour. Designed as a twin unit engine, the T-40 consists of two identical power sections. Each unit operates both contra-rotating propellers and for economical crews, one power section can be shut down entirely. Also, one power section by itself is another complete engine, meeting the requirements of a lower power range. This engine, designated the T-38 by the Navy, has important implications in commercial and military transports. The commercial version, model 501, is being proved first in the conveyor turboliner, which has been purchased by Allison as a flying test bed and as an investment in the future of turbine-powered transports. From this pioneering, the air traveler will get his first taste of vibrationless turbine power. Test pilots will prove turboprop engines for the commercial passenger just as they have turbojets for the military pilot. For the jets have already proved that they can take it. When the test pilot saunters out to his jet for a takeoff, he does so with confidence. Confidence in himself and his equipment and his jet engine. The jet pilot has a thorough knowledge of his airplane. He wears equipment to protect him as he travels close to the speed of sound. His flying suit inflates automatically to prevent the blood from rushing away from his head when he goes into a sharp turn or pulls out of a dive. His hard plastic helmet absorbs shock. He has his parachute, oxygen mask, emergency oxygen bottle. But above all, he has the skill and courage for high speed flight. And when he steps into his jet plane, he has more power at his fingertips than ever before handled by one man in the air. In a twin jet fighter, he controls 20,000 horsepower, 50 times more power than in the fighter plane of World War I, five times that of any fighter in World War II. Yet servicemen can pull the engine from an airplane and replace it in less than 30 minutes. Ground crews swear by its ease of maintenance. You will feel the power of these engines when you hear the whoosh of the Navy's North American Fury or Grumman Panther the Air Force's Republic Thunderjet, Lockheed Shooting Star, Northrop Scorpion, or Flying Wing. Today, many of the finest fighter aircraft of our aviation services are powered by the two jet engines which have helped bring about a complete revolution in military power plants. In spite of the limited time they have been in routine military operation, the jets now approach the reciprocating engine in durability and dependability. Jet engine developments have outmoded every fighter and bomber of World War II and are the basis for revolutionary new trends in commercial aviation. They have brought about such dramatic achievements as coast-to-coast -coast flights in three hours and 45 minutes. Mass flights of F-80s have flown the Atlantic in purely routine fashion, a feat that would have been unthinkable a few years ago. Jets like these have flown more than 100 million miles, the equivalent of about 4,000 times around the world. Already, jet engines have lifted airplane speeds a full 200 miles an hour over the top speeds of World War II and it seems that designs now on the drawing boards 
can double today's power with continued increases in speed and reductions in fuel consumption and cost. These new developments will play an important part in the world of tomorrow, where a growing parade of new engines and airplanes promises a new era of speed in the sky. Transportation from any point in the world to any point in the world, in a matter of a few short hours. Air power didn't win World War II alone, but in every campaign, the side that won had control of the air. We aviation-minded Americans are proud of our aircraft, which daily are crossing new frontiers of science. The whole peaceful world watches each new accomplishment and looks with grateful appreciation to our skies where the growing parade of new engines and airplanes spells out the words, air power is peace power. Thank you.